a todos y todas. Bienvenidas a esta la sesión magistral, la charla magistral del profesor Eichi Neguisi, Premio Nobel de Química del año 2010. Tenemos el placer de tenerlo en Encuentros Barcelona 2016 y esta charla estará moderada por el profesor eh, Pere Cabot. Él es decano de la Facultad de Química de la Universidad de Barcelona es doctor en Ciencias Químicas y catedrático del Área de Química Física desde el año 2003 en esta misma universidad. Actualmente es el decano de la Facultad de Química de la misma universidad, investigador del Laboratorio de Electroquímica de Materiales y del Medio Ambiente. Ha trabajado en las líneas de corrosión electroquímica, oxidación anódica, electrocatálisis, pilas de combustible y tratamiento electroquímico de contaminantes orgánicos en aguas. Y ahora les dejo con, con Pere Cabot. Thank you very much, Elena Sánchez, the organizer of this meeting, uh, for this presentation. Uh, well, it is an honor for me, uh, being the dean of the Faculty of Chemistry of this University of Barcelona, to introduce Professor Eishi Negishi. Uh, as you know, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2010. Well, let me say some words about uh, his biography. He's uh, extensive, but I only devote a few words because uh, it is an honor to have uh, between us this personality in the field. Well, Professor A. Sinegishi was born in, in 1935 in Sinking. Uh, Manchukuo, now uh, Changchun, China. Is it correct? Yes. And raised in Seoul, Korea, under Japanese rule. He has uh, Japanese nationality and his residence is in the United States of America. He has spent the most part of his career at Purdue University in the United States. His alma mater universities are the University of Tokyo, graduation in 19. 58, and of Pennsylvania, PhD in 1963. Postdoctoral researches at Purdue University in 1966. Was assistant professor of the same university in 1968, working with the Nobel laureate Herbert Brown. Was associate professor at Syracuse University in 1972, but he went back to Purdue University in 1979. And now is the university where uh, Professor Nagishi is working, still working, still actively working. He has more than 20 honors and awards. His main awards, because there is a long list, at the C. Edwards Franklin Prize Lectureship in 2000. And in 2010, he was declared Person of Cultural Merit and also he had into the Order of Culture. But the main award in 2010 was the Nobel Prize in Chemistry because he discovered the Kaupling reaction of his name, the Nikishi Kaupling, and he was awarded with his Nobel Prize for palladium catalyzed cross coupling in organic synthesis jointly with Richard Heck and Akira Suzuki. Well, I have here some uh, aspects about the, the Negishi coupling, but uh, I may say that it is widely employed transition metal catalyzed cross coupling reaction. And this reaction couples organic halides or triflates with organosine compounds forming carbon-carbon bonds in the process. A palladium species is generally used as the metal catalyst, so nickel is sometimes used. Well, this is only the introduction. Now we have to learn in w very much from the speech the lecture from Professor Nogishi. Please, Professor Nogishi, you have yeah. now the floor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much for kind introduction. <clears throat> uh, I, um, I have been uh, staying at Purdue University since 1979. And uh, well, before that, I was a postdoc of uh, Professor Brown. And as soon as I went back, within a couple of months <coughs> of my returning to Purdue, <clears throat> Professor Brown won a Nobel Prize. And I was predicting that since 19, early part of 1960, <clears throat> when he discovered uh, high, his you know, life, life work, hydroboration. <clears throat> and uh, when I heard him first, it was 1962, I was, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> a PhD student at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And back then, American uh, PhD schools were far superior to any, any in Japan. And uh, I, I learned a lot <clears throat> from scratch about chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania. But more than that, around 19, early part of 1960s, <laughs> Um, many, many Nobel Prize winners would come to University of Pennsylvania to give lectures. Maybe to the tune of uh, every one every month, something like that. So <clears throat> I was stand, uh, sitting in the front, front row learning what I, I was, you know, what, what was very attractive to me. <clears throat> But I looked at them, and I, I recognized that they are human beings. <laughs> They're human. <clears throat> so I told myself, well, their works are fantastic, but they are human beings like myself. So if I did very, very well, <laughs> I may have a just a remote chance of winning something like that. You know, that's how I, f I began feeling. That was my first sort of uh, Nobel connection. <laughs> and that was around 1962. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, A.C. Brown came. He had not won. He had not won yet. He won much later, but uh, I was very much impressed with his work. And he is going to go to the Stockholm. More than that, I would like to learn how to do this organometallic chemistry. You know, his work was organoboron chemistry. Uh, how to do something like that. So I was fully determined to go to Purdue as his postdoc. And I, I would uh, meet him, and I, was, uh, I expressed my interest, and, uh, which he accepted. So that's how I went to him, 1976. And boy, that was a very great experience. But uh, uh, I also surprised him. On the second day at Purdue, he and I had started discussing uh, a serious chemistry. And uh, I told him, I don't think what you are planning to do, you know, asking me to do, uh, will work. <laughs> Boy, he was so <laughs> surprised. And uh, in fact, uh, that work, that project was modified. I needed to modify the target. I needed to modify the starting structure, which was wrong. <laughs> so whatever you do, and whatever you do with that molecule would be different than, than predicted by Professor Brown. <laughs> so uh, my, first, uh, my first paper went into so-called the JAX's Journal of American Chemical Society. And uh, 
I, I essentially prove that uh, uh, his, his thinking, his uh, thought was not correct because his uh, predecessor's uh, conclusions were, were wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he is, if he is, I'm, I'm sure he's still al alive, I hope. He's a big, big shot in, uh, in Germany. And uh, so what, what I was asked is to treat some boron compound whose structure turned out to be wrong. And then I was to use a carbon monoxide to kick out boron and to put a carbon in there. And that was our main work, which of course came out to be wrong. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> based on German workers' uh, conclusion, uh, we, we came, you know, we were using wrong structure for the product. And I was warning Professor Brown, I don't think this structure is correct. Based on the so-called NMR spectra, very, very uh, vague indication. But later it turned out to be correct. What my fear was correct. <laughs> and uh, I think I, I gained uh, a lot of respect from <laughs> Professor Brown thereafter. And a year later, he asked me to become his, uh, his assistant, research assistant, with the rank of uh, assistant professorship. And I stayed with him for six years and published uh, something to the tune of 25, 30 papers with him. So that's how I built up my foundation, research foundation, uh, very solidly, <laughs> even though his initial uh, things were turned out to be wrong, but uh, never, uh, never mind, he was a fantastic mentor. And I went to Syracuse in 1972, and then I began doing my own thing. That is shown, shown uh, on the left-hand side of the slide. So <clears throat> this, is, this is the chemistry, actually, which I started in 1972 in Syracuse. And uh, in 1976, four years later, we had this, this chemistry. Not the whole thing, but the beginning of this chemistry. And uh, this one led, led, us, led me to Stockholm in 2010. So I discovered this in 1976, but I won uh, my prize in 2010. In the meantime, a few years later, uh, another person who worked in Brown's group uh, ahead of me, several years ahead of me, Akira Suzuki, he liked my chemistry and he took, <laughs> took away <laughs> this boron, boron part. Now it's called the Suzuki reaction. I don't understand, I don't understand. You know, I protest openly like this because they discovered, published in 1979, three years after we published <laughs> this reaction. But never mind, he's, he's still my friend. <laughs> but uh, I, <laughs> I never accept his, his claim as an uh, as a original claim. Okay, but in this, this one, I thought about this, as I told you, when I was a graduate PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I got the idea from a Lego game. Lego game, you know, you all know the Lego game. <clears throat> and uh, I thought organic synthesis, shouldn't, shouldn't we do organic synthesis in a Lego game fashion? What do I mean by that? Well, here's, here's a Lego game. Come on. <laughs> ah, yeah. Lego game, game piece one. R1, X, X is uh, something like a halogen. Halogen, electronegative. So it becomes delta minus here, X. And then R1 
then we'll become R1 delta plus. Let me say, let me skip delta, you know, because there are many, many delta. R1 plus. So here we have R1 plus. And then if we mix this with R2 metal, metal is more positive, so metal M is positive, plus. And then that makes R2 minus. Okay, so here we are mixing R1 plus containing compound with R2 minus containing compound. And we thought, like a Lego game piece, we can snap these two, snap it, snap them, then we get R1, R2 combined. So this is a original thought, my thought, a Lego game-like idea of a cross-coupling. Cross because R1 and R2 are different. That's, that gives the name cross. And the coupling because these two are coupled as, as shown here. Oops. Ooh, this takes five seconds to light up. <laughs> Okay, anyway, and then we, we cannot do that without any, some catalyst. And the catalyst plays a major role, many, many major role in chemistry. And uh, that was my, my sort of a sense at that time, and especially D-block transition metals, which I will show you in a minute, uh, such as nickel and palladium. They are a wonderful thing, and as you can see, they go around and around, and in the meantime, these two couple, and uh, M and X, of course, is coupled as a byproduct. Okay, so this one, with this thing, I, as I said, bicentennial years of America, yes, 1976 discovery, but, uh, uh, many years later, many few, <laughs> several decades later, I won a Nobel Prize with this thing. But I, um, today I may be spending more time speaking uh, this part of the chemistry, but let's go to the next one. Okay, so when I went to, as I said, Lego game invaded U.S. market, as far as I can tell, about 1960. And I was fascinated by this Lego game. And I got an idea. Shouldn't we do organic synthesis like the Lego game fashion? <laughs> and uh, what I mean by that is, so Lego game piece one uh, containing R1 plus, that's a hole. Lego game piece two, uh, that's a minus with a stick. So by mixing them, we get, we get a compound. But Turned out, without the catalyst, we cannot do that. So how do we do that? So, well, binding this one. I thought, you know, as a young, uh, reckless <laughs> scientist at the University of Pennsylvania, shouldn't we at least consider all the things that, that we have in Mendeleev's uh, periodic table? And you know how many are there? Right now, this year, earlier in Japan, someone uh, discovered uh, the, another, another element which should, should occupy this, this uh, 113th or something like that. And uh, Japan is also called the Nihon. So Nippon or Nihon. So this one was named Nihonium. But with a life, lifetime of less than a second. <laughs> but still, still it, this, that was a discovery, most recent one. So now my point is that uh, there are 113 or 14 now. I think 113 is the correct number. So this is uh, our universe. And I thought, as a, as a chemist, a synthetic chemist or any chemist, we should, be, we should be considering all these elements. You know, of course, many of them are not, not very well suited for your purpose, maybe, but at least we can, we can look at it. We should, uh, we should consider them. And uh, here is my way of thinking. 
So there are about 10 or 11, 11 shown in, in green, green frames, hydrogen and carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. So uh, these, are, these are what I call organic kind of element, organic elements. In other words, organic compounds, we, ourselves, except for bones and so on, mostly consist of these green ones. And uh, what I, well, actually there are, in addition to this 18 members, of course these uh, inert gas, five of them shown, six of them here, but that's a, that's a toxic. So these are inert, chemically inert. They can provide an inert atmosphere, but beyond that, it's very difficult to make use of them. What about these blue guys, blue ones? There are 20 plus members, blue ones. The blue ones are so-called main group metals, main group metals. Very familiar ones, lithium, sodium, magnesium, and so on. They are, they are, of course, very, very useful, very useful, but not in the sense that we li I like wanted to, to ma uh, make use of them. Okay, the one that I, I recognize is, uh, this is three times eight, three by eight, 24 minus one, technetium, that's an artificial element and the toxic and so on. So excluding this technetium, there are 23 so-called D-block, this, this is called the D-block, D-block transition metals. These are the golden metals. And uh, I, in a way, in my own way, I recognize, not I discover this uh, too much, recognize there are particular significance as catalyst. They are very expensive. Like this one, I was, I, I began emphasizing the synthetic significance of these three by eight, 24 minus technetium artificial element. And uh, that's the key message today. And they tend to be, some are, some are less exp you know, expensive, but they tend to be very expensive. Uh, expensive, like this one. This one is this one is gold. This one is platinum, even more expensive. This one is palladium, similarly expensive. But simply because they are expensive, uh, should should we or should we not use them? Well, here comes this concept of, of uh, catalysis. Catalysis is very very important because. If you can, if you use one, one piece or one atom or one mole, mole, molecule of uh, palladium, and you can turn over and over and over, ask them go around and around as I showed you, million times, if it costs a million dollars per mole, per, per molecule production, it's a big buck a mole. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> one dollar more. It's almost free. So that's the beauty of uh, catalysis. And indeed, many of our catalysts, catalysts containing these ex expensive metals, they will turn, turn over, you know, thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, uh, and, uh, you know, a million times and more. You know that. I was testing my, the, our, my student class, and uh, surprisingly, they came up with the correct answer. <laughs> so I w have to put you <laughs> people to the same, <laughs> through the same, same test. There are se several, few to several, most ex expensive D-block transition metals. We all must use every day, every day. Every day, we must use them. Otherwise, you may be jailed, or you run into a problem. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, so the 
question is what, what, what are they? We all are, this is by law, we must use it. Anyone? I'm sure there are chemistry teachers who don't want to. <laughs> yeah, okay. So those are, those are, as I said, gold, platinum, palladium, you know, some of these kinds of most expensive metals. They are hidden underneath the uh, you know, the car, in the dirtiest part of the car, the muffler. So these fine, fine pieces of these precious metals are sprinkled, very, very small amount. That's all we need. And in goes the exhaust gas containing carbon monoxide and others. They get instantly oxidized, and then carbon monoxide will become carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a bad gas today, but believe me, but that's the origin of all organic species <laughs> at the same time. So carbon dioxide is much safer carbon monoxide, compared with carbon monoxide. And I understand that when the car is junked, sent to the junkyard, the very first thing they do is to remove this uh, dirty muffler and recover, try to recover as much as possible because these things are sta very stable and recycle. So that's, that's the, one of the most extensive use of these. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are many, many cars in the world. So they, even if uh, uh, Per, ca per car use, usage is small, very small, but uh, to take care of all the cars all over the world, that is a lot of amount. And I understand that if not 50%, but like a 40% or so of the precious metal, they don't go to here, <laughs> they go to the bottom of the car. Okay, in this so this shows how powerful uh, and how efficient the D-block transition metals are as a catalyst, as an oxidation catalyst. Okay. And uh, I have been saying, so uh, my, I have been emphasizing the significance of D-block transition metals. And we must use them as an efficient catalyst. And uh, those things were done in a few cases in history. For instance, uh, uh, in Germany, I think, the catalytic converter, catalytic uh, uh, re uh, reduction was done uh, with the aid of uh, some of the D-block transition metals. But by and large, they were, they were uh, sent to the bottom of the car, that's the catalysis, or else uh, jewelry items. Okay, so here I'm showing uh, Mendeleev, Mendeleev, and uh, this one, if you go to, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, either uh, Berlin or uh, St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, I think. Uh, you see this uh, three, four story high periodic table. And I counted the number of elements, 91. Mendeleev knew, already knew, 91 elements. Now the number is, as I said, 113, 114 around there. So most of the elements were known, and uh, mo much more impressive is that he discovered 11 of them. <laughs> you know, 11 out of 91. That's about 10% of the universe. 10% <laughs> of the universe. I was very, very impressed. And uh, 
at that moment, I wanted to give him 11 Nobel Prizes because Madame Curie got the two Nobel Prizes for <laughs> discovering two uh, elements. But he came too, too soon. But the way he, you know, his main contribution, not, to, not just discover 11 elements, but uh, he laid them, he, he laid them correctly, and then he, when he saw a blank box, there should be an element, and if we discover it, then it, its uh, specific gra gravity should be something like that. Its basic properties should be like this. He was predicting. He was a true scientist and discoverer, 11 of them. Just mind-boggling. Okay, so I better go. I, better. I, was, I began emphasizing the significance of the D-block tra transition metals. And in my opinion, more we use them and the better we use them, these D-block transition metals, we will, be, we will be improving our living conditions in this world. And uh, my, our uh, cross-coupling, uh, palladium catalyzed cross-coupling, is used for making, synthesizing all kinds of uh, fine drugs. Uh, they are, by and large, dis discovered, invented, uh, and then they need a method for, for synthesizing. So, so deep, our deep rock transition metal, can, particularly catalysis around here, they are very, very useful. Okay, but I am not getting involved in that. I haven't so far earned a, earned a single penny. <laughs> but the more recent chemistry I have been patenting because I want to be rich. <laughs> But primarily, I want to earn money and uh, set up some research, research center or something like that. Okay, what's so special about metals? What's so special about the D-block transition metals? Well, so here we have we have alkane. Carbon is here, and around carbon there is a one bar or one dotted line is equivalent to two electrons. So two plus two plus two plus two. So eight electrons are, are uh, surrounding this carbon. <clears throat> then it's fully satur saturated, eight electrons. And of course, many, many useful things are like that. But here down below, I show all of them. So in this case, one carbon is surrounded by two, four, six, eight, eight electrons, but this middle one is, one, one of them is a weaker pi, so-called pi bond, pi bond. Okay, <clears throat> and, but these species are chemically relatively inert, but now if you can generate species like this, two, four, six, six electron species, with one being empty, and which should be positively charged to count, to count uh, this uh, <clears throat> uh, charge, charge number, <clears throat> six, two, four, six. Then these are called the carbocation, very, very reactive. And it will react instantly, and uh, <clears throat> so it will then form a <clears throat> new compound. And, uh, Brown, Professor Brown's hydroboration is, it requires borane. Borane has two, four, six electrons, electrons surrounding it. And uh, one is this. So this one is, we call this isoelectronic. So electronic configurations are same. In this case, of course, we, we must ignore the charge. <clears throat> but sure enough, just like the carbocations react very rapidly like so, Brown's borane react add very rapidly like so. This is a hydroboration. 
So you see the significance of electro count, electron count. And then you can extend that to some transition metal, d block transition metals. This one is complicated, I, so I will just tell you. In this form, this is zirconium hydride, like a boron hydride. This one is a 16 electron species, 10 more. So because we count up to 18 when we deal with a D-block transition metal. Okay, but key thing is that if you look at this part and this part, they look alike. They look alike. And sure enough, they react alike. This one adds to this. You, give, you get this one. This one also adds in a similar way, and you get this. So that's how chemistry, chemistry works. So, uh, but <clears throat> one thing in, my, in our search for cross-coupling or coupling, we, there was one big barrier we, which we needed to overcome, and that is shown here. <clears throat> so here's acid represented by this empty orbital. Here's a base represented by two electron lone, lone pair containing one. So if you mix them, usually you get this one in a, in a hurry. So in this way, we can do all kinds of <clears throat> AB bond formation. So we thought, but turned out that there is a, there is a pitfall in this, uh, in this scheme. And I want you to understand this. So acid and the base, they come together. The B starts sending electrons to empty orbital of acid. Now look at this. So A, by virtue of begin, you know, beginning to receive this electron pair, it, it will become minus, delta minus. B, on the other hand, it has it begins to lose a pair of electrons, it will be positively polarized. What is the effect of this polarization? Well, so this negative charge will say, don't come, go back to B. It will start working against this coupling. B, on the other hand, said, with this delta plus positive charge to these outgoing electrons, don't go, don't go. Come back. So that, that will raise the uh, <clears throat> activation energy, reaction barrier, very high. So this one is uh, universally true in a single, single level uh, acid-base, acid-base interaction. So here is, here is a key, key slide. And uh, what we have now here is a <clears throat> so this scheme. This one is called the dual chat duncanson model of D block transition metal and then olefin complex. So now what you see is olefin pi bond, pi bond is here with two electrons as it provides two electrons to transition metal empty orbital. If the transition metal can have both empty orbital and the field non-bonding orbital, they can back donate and two up, two go up, two go down. Why is it so good? Because as I told you, if it's a one way, uh, the undesirable charge separation takes place and then the reaction becomes more and more difficult. But in this two-way two -way movement, two up, two down, there is no such problem. So that's the beauty. This is, this, this is a very, very important scheme, which you may not appreciate yet, but it was due to Kenichi Fukui. I understand that he was doing this kind of thing in a submarine during the World War II with hand-cranking <laughs> calculators. 
And uh, he, so he was released, and then uh, in 1951, he published this uh, <coughs> theory, Fukui's theory, homo lumo, homo lumo theory. So any good reactions, he said, shouldn't have just a homo two electron containing homo lumo, empty orbital, just one way. There should be a counteracting homo lumo reaction. Then reactions can be very, very favorable. So in this case, they, we use d block transition metals here, and then d block transition metals can both of, have both of these. So empty one can accept two electrons, and these dehybridized two electron containing orbital can back donate, back donate. Okay, but this scheme, I was fascinated by this thing, and actually, uh, as some of you already know, uh, Woodward and Hoffman at Harvard University, they came up with the Woodward-Hoffman rule. But origin of the Woodward-Hoffman rule is a Fukui's uh, homo lumo, homo lumo theory, which was also embraced by Dewar and others. So no wonder Fukui won the Nobel Prize in 1980 or so. Anyway, but uh, this, is, this is a very important page. So hydroboration of brown or other hydrometallation. Why are they so, so rapid? Well, because with the hydro, in hydroboration, BH3 is a six, six electron species. So BH2 electron containing one, and there is always empty orbital. It's not a D block uh, transition metal. But nevertheless, combination of this two electron containing one homo and then empty lumo, then it will react in the same way, similar way like this. No wonder hydrometallation is so fast. But then I thought, can we not displace this hydrogen with other elements? If we re replace this hydrogen with carbon, then we can have a carbometallation, I hope. And that's how we saw. And the carbometallation reaction was already known. It was discovered by a German chemist, you know, the polymer chemist. I forgot his name. <laughs> you, you probably know. But his reaction was a polymerization reaction. Longer the better. He couldn't stop after one. But we thought, we thought it would be nice if we can add once and uh, stop it. That is our uh, carbometallation, which we now affectionately call the Zaka reaction. And I will talk about the Zaka reaction in a minute. But you, when I looked at this thing, I, I thought about this thing. Some examples were known, but uh, uh, we made it very, very general <coughs> and uh, stereoselective. So then I thought, shouldn't we stop here? Maybe we can put all kinds of metals in this position rather than hydrogen and carbon. So how about the halogen? Putting halogen is a very dangerous proposition because halogen is ele highly electronegative, metal is highly electropositive. The, this one is a strong bond, and by cleaving a strong bond, Addition may not take place, contra thermodynamic. So we thought, but we were wrong. In UK, uh, so boron, boron chemist, they, so boron, boron is very electronegative. So this bond is thermodynamically weak. So they were able to cleave this one. And the halo boration was discovered by them, 1964. Okay. But um, many, many metallometallation reactions are, were also discovered. But I think this carbometallation is a, is a very good one that I wanted to talk about. Actually, carbometallation was not original one, not discovered by us. This one was discovered by a German polymer chemist, polymer chemist. But in his reaction, you get, you add, keep adding, and you get a polymer. So. Not uh, the not, uh, organic compound. Now I go to 
this cross coupling. Lego game. So I showed you some other examples, but using using uh, palladium, for instance, as a catalyst, we can hook these two. These two, if you mix them, really nothing much happens. Maybe negative throw, negative things may happen. With the use of uh, catalyst, that was discovered in 1978. So now we can, we can uh, cross-couple these two with the aid of palladium as a catalyst. And as you can see, and then after uh, we, we discovered this thing, uh, Suzuki, uh, they kept chasing us <laughs> with boron. <laughs> and then there was another one who unfortunately uh, passed away, be, uh, do, you know. Now we have a general way of uh, coupling two different pieces together in a very highly selective way with virtually no, uh, no ill effect. And uh, yields are generally very high. So for instance, we, now we, can, we began challenging the synthesis of all kinds of molecules. And we, have, we may have simplified or made, made uh, some of these complex molecule synthesis very, very efficient, uh, far beyond the previous technology. So this one, amphotericin, would you try to synthesize this molecule? <laughs> Before discovery of these uh, polyene syn synthesis, I, I would be just looking at this thing, marveling, and then, but, well, not long ago. We finally got the right method, the right synthesis. So, as you can see, all kinds of, uh, uh, Polyene, oligoenes are selectively synthesized, and uh, let, let's just go on. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's just a one class of compounds that we have synthesized, <clears throat> and uh, here. So this one is. Uh, you, with, yeah. With this, you yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, but I need to Further? go back. No, oh, I need. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, for instance. This, this kind of triene, you know, each, each double bond can be cis or trans. Cis or trans, cis or trans, cis or trans. Three of them. So two times three, eight. Eight isomers. So before us, it must have been a life, lifetime work <laughs> or something like that. But with our technology or with our method, you can, you can synthesize this, them all in a couple of months, okay. Or if you if you work harder, <laughs> even even shorter. So this is trans, 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 and you you make one cis, you make uh, this one cis, you make uh, both sides cis. There are two times two times two, uh, eight possible isomers, and uh, just for the fun of it we decided to synthesize them all because, and no problem, almost like a, uh, well, I didn't do anything <laughs> experimentally. <laughs> but as you can see, look at these, this coupling yield is nearly 80, 90%, but more impressively, in my opinion, purity, Isomeric purity was nearly perfect, nearly perfect. But now, scary moment, how do I advance? <laughs> so four down, and the fifth and the sixth one, they, they contain the middle, middle cis double bond, which was a little more difficult one, but no, no problem, no difficulty. Just slight, slightly more difficult. OK, five, fifths, and six down, next one. Okay, the seventh and eighth, 
gave them, the, these co my co-workers, a little difficulties. And one of them came to me, and we cannot synthesize them. So I asked this person, why do you think so? Nobody has ever made anything, <laughs> synthesized anything like this. <laughs> so I said, that's why we want to do it. <laughs> okay. So, but as, so, uh, no problem. So, and here again, in uniformly high, nearly 100% purity, purity, we were able to handle these cis double bond. So, next slide. Okay, so this one is maybe I, I'd like to stop after this one. This one, many of, many of us every day take coenzyme, CoQ10, you know. So I think you, if you want to live a little longer, <laughs> that's what they, they recommend. So CoQ10 has this one. So these are very, very difficult to synthesize. Okay, and, uh, but we synthesize it in all of, from here, from these intermediate, about 10 steps, I think. So, uh, no problem, no major problem. Next slide. Okay, so our, my last example is uh, this theoceranic acid because it was, uh, among us specialists, a uh, major challenge. You know, the uh, Dutch, no, the Netherlands, uh, Netherlands, Netherlands uh, uh, Belgium, Belgium uh, group, they synthesized this compound, this compound, which is this part of the, this gigantic molecule, in 27 steps. 27 steps. Uh, I don't think that, uh, oh yeah, it says 20 long. Uh, uh, we can make money out of this synthesis. Next slide. Okay. We needed to invent new reaction. I don't have time. You just take my words. Next slide. Next slide. Next one. So, next. Uh, next, until we get, yeah, okay. All right, so, so we were able to synthesize some, some very challenging molecules like this one. These are called isotopomer. So this, this branch and this branch are different only by the presence of four isotopes very much away from this one. So if you make, synthesize this thing, there is no rotation observable. And this one likewise, and this one likewise. But we know that we have synthesized them as a very, very pure compound. Next slide. OK. So in this case, uh, most of the chromatographic tools were useless. And uh, we only we only need to p synthesize as pure as p possible, but even the detection, detection of the, the pur purity, you know, determination of purit purity was very, very difficult. But eventually, we learned that uh, this NMR, NMR is an uh, ultimate tool, and uh, using this one, and with using a Moja esta, Moja esta is, is this one, we were able to tell the difference between this deuterium containing one and uh, in a remote, remote place. And uh, so the mixture, when we make a mixture without worrying about the stereochemistry, then we get a one-to-one -one mixture. One-to-one -one mixture showed this uh, triplet, triplet of doublet, doublet of triplet, double, 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 triplet. Okay. Then we made, our, by our method, stereoselective one. Look at this. So you have this signal, yes. You don't see a, even trace of this signal, this one, middle one. And you have this signal, yes, big one. Nothing is seen on this slope. 
in my eye. <laughs> and this one, likewise, you see ye yes, but none of these. That proves that we have a single isomer, single isomer, and which is essentially 100% pure. And this is a very, very uh, rare case. And we didn't even do, well, we didn't even do a purification in the bottom way. We were able to get that, that pure. Oh, sorry, there's one purification in the middle, the easy part. But I skipped that next one. So th this one, the box part is called the, did, did I already show this one? So this part. So there was a history. So the one group already several the 10 years ago or so synthesized it, but in 27 long, long step, overall yield 2.5%. I don't think it's practical, hardly practical. OK, sorry <laughs> to mention this. So, and then the Swiss group. Swiss people must have a very high experimental technique. And I was amazed by there are 20% overall yield, but still they went through, uh, sorry, 15, uh, 20 steps, but they obtained this compound in 15% yield. I was amazed. I don't know how, how they can do that. How they can go through 20 steps and maintaining the yield at this level. But never mind. Our synthesis, shown here, is very highly convergent. Only eight steps. Eight steps. Our yield uh, lag behind this one. But we think that this is the most practical and the most desirable synthesis. And we, we should probably try to improve the yield. So in this convergent way, we would synthesize this two methyl key, per, key piece and also two methyl substituted uh, left-hand side piece. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I touched it wrong. And then a three methyl substituted piece. So two plus two plus, yeah. In this way, we get the phenyl substituted one, and that was oxidized. Overall yield is 8%, but only eight longest linear steps. And any day, I will prefer this. OK, so I need to go to the, OK, so you see, we don't see. We see all the, need, all the signals that we need to see, but none other, no other signal that we we see it's absolutely pure. Next one. So this. So let's start with the dreams. Let's start with the need. These can start your research. Then we have to set a good goals. Good goals. Then with this, then good knowledge is important. Wealth, wealth of ideas are very, very important. And the willpower to continue, take action, good judgment. These are the four, four kinds of elements during your systematic and long range exploration. And then, of course, what is also needed is optimism and the persistence. And then you need to buy some serendipity once in a while. If you count them all, I think I made it 10. And then if you, if you mix all these uh, and deal with all these 10, 10 components well, in due course, I think we, you might be discovering. That is my key message. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nagishi, for this excellent presentation with a lot of information and a lot of things. Uh, um, which undoubtedly uh, may be a large for a, <laughs> a much more long time and many lectures to be introduced in depth on this knowledge. <laughs> but 
we have an idea about the significance in the field of chemistry, organic chemistry in particular, after his presentation. Uh, here we have uh, some questions from the audience. So uh, let me uh, formulate these questions in the name of the audience. For example, one, PD has been a very important element in catalysis for the past, for the past years. Do you expect another D-metal to take the lead in catalysis field in the upcoming years? And I have also another question related to this one, because it, it states that, as you have commented, the transition metals have been really interesting for catalysis in the 20th century. What do you think about lanthanide catalysts as uh, cesium ammonia nitrate for LOMO catalysis? Are they going to be the 21st century catalyst? Well, uh, yeah, I believe so, but uh, I guess we luckily recognized, already known, but uh, in bits and pieces, uh, in a sort of a unified, unified way, uh, the fundament, you know, fantastic catalytic activities of D-block transition metals in appropriate electronic configuration. You know, even the D-block transition metals, if you saturate, <laughs> saturate all the uh, orbitals with the two electrons, then you may not have a good, good catalyst. So electron counts are very, very important. And uh, there will be many, many more uh, wonderful examples coming out of this D-block transition metals. But we have not, we have not explored yet this uh, heavier, heavier one. And uh, one thing I, you know, I am concerned about is uh, there are um, uh, this, how should I say that? Uh, uh, dangerous <laughs> properties, properties of, yeah, uh, much heavier ones. And uh, that scares me. So, you, Another thing is that we have just uh, extensively dealt with uh, portions of the D-block transition metals as of today. So <laughs> I have to live two, three more times <laughs> to, to explore the others from a, a little different angles. But uh, at the moment, I, uh, my hands are all full with the D-block transition metals. We have discovered this cross-coupling. We have discovered the carbometallation. We have uh, discovered yet, a, yet another one, which we are just about publishing. So uh, seems like our, what we need to do with the D-block transition metals is, uh, if not endless, there are many, 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 many more. And many, many other people can still jump into this D-block transition metal chemistry. And, uh, they can show their own, their own things as, as attractive, as important as hopefully what I've discussed. Another question uh, says, is the difference between different transition metals great enough to expect a different reactivity for the same reaction when using a different metal as a catalyst? Or they just act as a transferring agent in a similar way? Well, I believe that all 113 or 14 elements, you know, I, I may exclude, I usually exclude the radioactive one, intrinsically radioactive ones for, for safety. And uh, uh, what was the other group? But anyway, uh, by and large, they, each one of them shows its own, its own characteristic and own properties. So there are, there are lots of opportunities 
And uh, uh, I think it, it may come from uh, inside of our brain. And uh, many, many more uh, wonderful new things can be discovered, and especially with the D-block transition metal. Uh, so we are, you know, we have uh, specialized in only a uh, few to several of them when there are 20 some. Mm -hmm. So uh, my expectations are very, very high. Mm -hmm. But probably other people have to. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, how much uh, D-block uh, transition metals are used today in biomedicine? For example, in conjunction with uh, nanoparticles for targeting tumors or administrating drugs? I would say, coming from Japan, <laughs> I, I have contacts with uh, many pharmaceutical companies in Japan. They seem to be using this uh, coupling and then, and then um, I'm not so sure about, uh, uh, about this carbometallation yet. You know, they haven't reached that level of experiences yet. They seem to be very, very happy with uh, cross-coupling. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I cannot put the number you know, uh, with confidence, but uh, uh, sounded like at least a third or a half or some maybe more of the production of uh, uh, fine, fine chemicals and, and drugs and so on, they might involve the use of these uh, trans transition metals. For example, when uh, you received the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. uh, in the literature, we found that uh, one example was the application in the uh, discodermolite Disco synthesis, yeah, yeah. which is a potent inhibitor of, of tumor uh, cell growth. Mm. And uh, this uh, compound mm. was first uh, isolated in 1990 mm. from the Caribbean sea sponge. Mm? From the Caribbean sea sponge. And Chi? from the, the sea. Uh, a sponge. A sponge, sponge of, of the sea. Yes. Oh, yes. okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, this compound is sensitive to light, mm -hmm. so the sponge uh, should be, must be collected to mm -hmm. a depth of 33 meters. 33. And uh, supply necessary for full uh, clinical trials cannot be achieved by harvesting, isolating, and purification. Mm -hmm. So the synthesis uh, to test it, it is the, the way. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, one of the application of the, uh, your coupling reaction is mm. the synthesis of this uh, important compound to mm. be tested in, the, in life. Yeah. Uh, as I said, in, in Japan, most, if not all, of the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies, they, they are using this thing for in a, in a fundamental, uh, at the fundamental level, as well as in manufacturing and production level. Mm -hmm. so, so I understand. Uh, so, as I said, uh, in trying to favor faster publication, we, we completely shut, <laughs> shut out uh, patent application. So, mm -hmm. uh, none of these has been patented by, by us. But in a more recent one, we decided to patent, and uh, I have just received a, a patent, you know, the notice. But uh, we don't know the story about this one. Uh -huh. Maybe I'll be gone. <laughs> another question is in the personal uh, level. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what did you say when you got the call from Stockholm? Oh, Stockholm. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, five, five o'clock in the morning. And the funny thing is that uh, my colleagues in the chemistry department of, at, at Purdue University, 
they were, they were telling me, many of them were telling me, this is your time, your chance, your time, you know. <laughs> so then I went home and I was talking to my wife and, uh, okay, I may, I may get one. I may be one uh, reasonab in a reasonable way of thinking. I may be one in ten candidates as of now, today. That's what, uh, with this you can, you can sense, you can tell. But one in ten is only one person out of ten <laughs> equally uh, uh, promising candidates. So it would be crazy to think that we might get one. You know? But then we slept. Five o'clock in the morning, our time, phone bell rang. And one thing I did do was to move my phone within my reach. <laughs> that tells my, <laughs> my psychology. <laughs> and then at the end of the line, uh, there was this uh, good morning. <laughs> we have the present news for you. <laughs> this is <a> Scandinavian <laughs> accent. <laughs> so I said, oh, oh <laughs> maybe. <laughs> And that turned out to be the real thing. And uh, five o'clock at our place, and, but they, this person said, please keep this thing within your family, this, this announcement. Uh, in one hour's time, in one hour later, we will the, announce to the rest of the world. So, but we thought we want to inform you one hour ahead of time. Uh, and uh, sure enough, uh, that day was a crazy day. <laughs> Actually, uh, about 12 interviewing trucks. <laughs> they covered the car de sac in front of our house. And uh, that thing started actually serious, in a serious way towards the evening because during the daytime there were a series of Purdue University uh, celebration events. And I was asked to give a lecture here and lecture there and talk, you know, interview there and so on. So actual in a uh, series of uh, media interview started uh, late, later that that evening, and uh, uh, as you can imagine, a Japanese uh, broadcasting company, NHK, <laughs> they occupy the maximum amount of time. And when their interview was over, it was already uh, seven, between seven and eight a.m. next morning. So I have been claiming that that day I worked for 20, 27 or 28 hours. <laughs> so, but that was a very, very exciting, exciting moment. And uh, during that, uh, Japanese Prime Minister uh, called me and uh, Emperor, uh, uh, Emperor, I'm not sure about uh, this Imperial fa Palace called me. So that was a very, very exciting, exciting day. Yes, and W was very excited and impressive. <laughs> <laughs> On the phone, phone call uh, at yeah. five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> wake up, a good wake up, yes. <laughs> yes, a good wake up. The session uh, is, is finished, uh, so we have to uh, open the session.